up everyone, this is your boy The Crook. I'm out at Gibbs Business School, the most prestigious business institution in the country. And I'm here to give a talk on building an unorthodox personal brand. Um, I come from a branding background uh, where I was able to build my brand from nothing. And yeah, let's go ahead and go check what's going on. I just want us to engage um, the, um, the topic at hand because um, I realize that uh, I'm not talking or speaking to kids in high school here, I'm speaking to peers, people that I might generally be engaging at parties, um, at the bar, at the airport, wherever, you know what I mean? So um, I'll, 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 I'll put my best foot forward, but um, I'd also like you to stop me as and where you'd like to, and let's engage it further, because I think that's where we all learn. So my name is Gutlano. Um, I'm, broad, uh, well, I'm born and bred in Davidson. Um, I'm a radio DJ at YFM. I'm a touring DJ. Um, I won the Black Coffee X competition about three years ago. Got a chance to go to Ibiza to go play alongside Black Coffee at High. Probably one of the biggest highlights of my life. I never stopped touring and doing radio and and, 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 and just immersing myself in, in, in just finding and exploring new markets in the music and entertainment space. And um, I come from a very, very intimate background with um, the branding space and, and, and just like brands and marketing. So um, I unfortunately could not finish my BCom marketing, no, BCom law, and I joined a marketing firm called Murati Fellas. I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with a guy called Musa Kalenga. Musa. Musa Kalenga. Yeah, he's probably the biggest and youngest marketing guru um, that South Africa has got to offer. And um, he got me my first job uh, when he was trying out his agency. And uh, we did some really, really, really cool shit. Um, we rebranded knickknacks. We rebranded Praza, we rebranded Contempo Condoms, um, <laughs> SA Express, and um, there's a beer in Ghana called Tasca, if I'm not mistaken. We rebranded that. So I've got a very, very intimate relationship with branding. And um, just from a personal branding perspective, um, I'm gonna play a little video of what people relates to me as in this day and age. Like right now, when people see me, this is what comes to mind. We are Zazmo season to Zaseluxi. There's a big debate about which township Amma Piano originated from. The truth of the matter is, Amma Piano was born in the soil of the streets of South Africa. Therefore, it belongs to all of us. It was never something you would hear on radio. A lot of stations undermined it. In fact, they called it inferior quality, except for one guy, the crook. He gave it a platform on radio by introducing Ama Piano Hour. I think my first interaction with Ama Piano music um, was uh, through mixtapes and through guys just sending me like uh, WhatsApp mixes or WhatsApp songs, you know what I mean? Uh, they weren't nicely mixed down, nicely mastered. They were very terrible, but like the bass lines and the progressive keys were like crazy, you know? Um, piano is, is, is one of the only genres where a guy that is big on YouTube, big on WhatsApp, and big on uh, data file host mixtapes is actually getting shows and gigging, you know what I mean? Uh, you haven't seen that um, a lot in hip-hop, you haven't seen that in Afro House, you haven't seen that a lot um, in, in many other genres, you know what I mean? There's always a, a business person that is trying to dictate where the artist should go and, and dictating uh, how much money the artist should be making. But um, these guys are, have literally painted their own canvas. There are a lot of guys that couldn't literally come to my Players Club show that I needed to e wallet like the the two clipper, you know what I mean, so that they can actually come mix on the show, you know? And and to almost see those guys like move from strength to strength and being able to like have covers for songs now and you find songs with ISRC codes, you know what I mean? That for me is like uh, the next level, you know what I mean? So if you're wondering why Amapiano is so big in this damn country and you're changing from station to station and there's this banging sound that you can't stand, I am to blame. 
<laughs> so let's get into the business of the day. Um, I want us to talk about building an unorthodox personal brand through the digital lens of urban culture. And unorthodox, um, for me, m almost means that uh, we can't use principles that have been used like by textbooks that were uh, written in 1919, no one knows who, in this day and age, because things are just so diverse, they're different. Um, I mean, social media has taken over. So I think in terms of building a personal brand today, we can't literally take what a textbook says in verbatim, but we almost need to take a bit of information, but see where we are in, in whatever brand that we are trying to create. So I'm, sh I'm sure Silas has gone through the boring stuff about what a brand is, but um, the simplest definition for a brand to me is a gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. So whatever gut feeling you've got towards Nike, that's what the brand is. Whatever gut feeling you've got towards Uber, Beats by Dre, YFM, that for me is the simplest way of defining what a brand is. And the process of branding. Yep. Um, so if it's a gut feeling, then it's not something that Nike can control per se, because they no. can't control how I feel about the brand or what my gut feeling about them is. They can try portray a certain image, but if that's not what I'm getting, then I'll have my own view of what it is, right? Definitely. So that's what you kind of are saying, that you'll show up as, you'll try to put your best foot forward, but at the end of the day, is what the other person feels about you. Yeah. Definitely. It's almost like how Nando's has positioned their brand. Um, some people think it's funny, some people think it's trolling, some people think, it, you know what I mean? Like, th there's just many views about how they position their brand but um, it's based on how you feel towards the brand. And let's look at the process of branding. Obviously, when creating a brand, you need to conduct a research case just to basically know what you're selling, whether it's a service, goods, or where you're trying to position it, who your customers are, They're clarifying a strategy. So basically being able to draw a line from A to B, from your product to your consumer. Designing an identity, um, that speaks to being different in this age of clutter, where all these logos are in our faces, all these people are in our faces. Uh, we need to be different, and that's what designing a brand, I mean, an identity is. Creating touch points, how are you gonna to get to your customer? And then managing the asset, the day-to-day -day running of a business, which most of you will definitely know about. So, I'm going to say something very controversial because um, I live on YouTube and um, I was watching a dialogue by Steve Stout. He's the owner of uh, United Masters. As an artist, um, I'm a big believer that um, one should remain independent, especially in an age where there's social media at your disposal. Um, there's, there's just a lot happening for artists to own what they create. You really don't need a record label and, and like these so-called well-oiled machines to get your product out to the consumer because the consumer is at the tip of your fingerprint. So I believe that today's world, in today's world, the most powerful force for creating financial capital is through cultural capital. I don't know how you guys feel about that statement. Any takers? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> How would you define cultural capitalism? That's what I'm going to get to. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you are familiar with this picture. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, we just, we, we think there's a group named the Missing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this picture was taken in 2009 on 26th of January at the Paris Fashion Week. 
And um, from left to right um, is Doncy. There's a guy called Tez Arnold. There's a guy behind Kanye West called Chris Julian, Kanye West, uh, Fonsworth Bentley, and Virgil Abloa. So, um, what made this picture so iconic was that um, before these guys actually went to Paris Fashion Week, um, hip hop as a culture, hip hop as a mindset, hip hop as a movement um, did not have a place in high end fashion. So um, before 2009, your diddies would frequent fashion shows, but they would, they, they would look the part. So it's almost like going to a wedding and wearing a three piece suit. You know, you're not changing anything. You're just adapting to what was happening. And these guys decided, screw that. We're going to give hip hop and urban culture presence. The impact of that picture, circa 2012, 2013. This is a scene taken from South Park. This was before memes. This was before like all these funny things that we like sharing on social media and to show the impact of what these guys did at the time. There was no financial gain at that point in time, but from a social capital perspective, everyone was latching onto it and started talking about how these misfits were able to find a place in the Paris Fashion Week, which is the most prestigious fashion runway in the world. And then, almost 10 years later, the same guys in the front frame are the biggest fashion spearheading urban black people of our time. So from left to right, Don C has done many collaborations with the NBA. So the NBA was struggling to speak to their core market and um, there was no diversity in the NBA for a long time where a lot of black people used to watch the NBA but they weren't speaking it. So they partnered with Don C to create apparel and cool sneaker designs that you wouldn't find on the court but you'd find on every street corner because black people were consuming this thing. Taz Arnold, the guy with the funky glasses and the hat, um, he started his own um, apparel brand called Tissa, and he started as a snapback cap into t-shirt branding and um, became one of the biggest creatives to ever win a Grammy alongside Kendrick Lamar for his How to Pimp a Butterfly album cover. So if, if you can imagine that album cover with all those kids with money and gold chains and he was one of the guys behind it. Chris Julian. Chris Julian basically went to Vegas to go start the first ever urban clothing boutique. So urban clothing was sold in street corners, in chain stores, but was never in the spotlight of glam, um, quality, and an almost high end. And he was the first guy to start a chain of boutique stores where we start looking at urban clothing differently. And thanks to him, that happened. Well, Kanye West is Kanye West. Everybody knows about Kanye, but I think um, his biggest um, win to date was the fact that um, Yeezy was almost, um, has almost, um, well, not as almost, but um, was um, based on a Forbes forecast that Yeezy in 2020 would be a billion dollar company. And that's a big thing for somebody that was just trying to make a statement in 2009. Fonsworth Bentley, who's a big fan of P. Diddy and Puff Diddy. <laughs> okay, you seem like you're a fan, brother. Remember when P. Diddy was still the running bad boy and B.I.G. was still there and, 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 and so forth. He had a butler and a guy that used to dress well and hold his umbrella. 
That's Fonz Will Bentley. And now is one of the biggest creative directors um, for content on BET when it comes to fashion shows. And then Virgil Abloh, um, probably the most um, important figure of our time when it comes to like high-end fashion. Um, he now is one of the creative, head creative directors of Louis Vuitton and has got a huge brand called Off-White that um, probably our little brothers and sisters are trying to hustle our parents to getting them. <laughs> and then let's talk about misinformed cultural decisions that cost business a fortune. Let's start with Bad Boys 1. So in 1995, um, after Will Smith had done his Fresh Prince of Bel Air stint and was that funny guy and whatever, 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 um, Sony Movies decides to cast him and Martin Lawrence for a cop movie with two black guys. And um, basically, the benchmark for Bad Boys 1 was Coming to America by Eddie Murphy. They were trying to recreate a black superstar, superheroes, and, and that kind of mindset. Bad Boys 1 blows up in the States. And then Will Smith, in an interview, sits Sony Pictures down and says, hey guys, we're big in the States. Let's try to take this thing all across the world. And we want to actually open the movie. So if the premiere is happening in London, let me and Martin actually go to London, go talk about the movie, and let people watch the movie for the first time. And Sony declined, because they did not believe in African Americans opening movies. And fast forward to this year, in the age of Netflix, pay-per-view, um, watching content on YouTube, um, I think probably 70 to 80% of this room has gone to the movie house to go watch Bad Boys 3 because it just seems like, as like a cool thing to do. And I feel that if Sony had let them do what they needed to do at the time, they probably would have made a lot more money because this was the age of like VHS. Yeah. Fast forward to two years later. So now Will Smith is on a cover with a white Tommy Lee Jones. No hate to all the Caucasian people in the room. Um, now he's able to go across the world and push the narrative and sell the movie and open movies in different uh, countries because of uh, Tommy Lee Jones' uh, CV and rapport. Um, but the biggest mistake that Men in Black did was the fact that um, after Will Smith lost his um, recording label, I mean, um, recording deal at a record label, um, because hip hop had, had, had like a, a, a different turn in 1997. That's when um, your Tupacs and B.I.G.'s and Wu-Tang Clans were like prominent, and nobody wanted to get jiggy with it anymore. Um, Steve Stout decides, hey Will, um, since you're on Men in Black, let's actually make a soundtrack for the Men in Black album. They make the soundtrack, the soundtrack sells about 10 million copies. But little did they know that the sunglasses in the movie and in the cover, the Ray-Ban sunglasses, will sell 12 million units without paying a cent. And if you remember back to when Men in Black was big, that was the boom of the sunglasses. Let's bring it back home. Anybody remember the uh, social impact of YFM and Lokshan culture? I mean, this was probably the most important time for South African youth. Um, Lokshan culture and YFM were able to position themselves in music, in young, unorthodox, that's, that's the word for today, <laughs> unorthodox uh, radio personalities that just had a lot to say and weren't um, sticking to what everyone else was doing, into TV with Yizo Yizo and many other platforms, and also creating ambassadorship opportunities to almost showcase the world that 
we can be ambassadors to brands ju just by being ourselves. And their touch point was a craziest event. So if anybody knew how big and how important YFM parties were in the 90s, you'll definitely know that their touch point was a really, really, really important place to be, to interact with the brand, to interact with DJs, to interact with a lockdown culture, to interact with what the pulse of urban youth culture was in South Africa. I believe that without this paradigm, we wouldn't have the shift. I believe that Trevor Noah, who used to work at YFM, would never be able to think bigger than just doing comedy in South Africa. I believe that Shoma Josie would not think as big as preserving who we are as South Africans and Africans and knowing that it would stick to a global market. Caspar Nyovest would not start and stain our minds that African brands are as important as global brands for filling up stadiums and giving show quality. Black coffee wouldn't have given us a seat at the table. Mithali wouldn't have collaborated with brands on her own terms, using her own voice and how she feels that young Africans are speaking to each other. And um, Ricky Rick with Cotton, on, with Cotton Fest, um, thinking out of the box in terms of unconventional ways of selling a festival and actually not just making money from ticketing and sponsors, but also selling merch to create other income streams. Which brings me to the next point. What was your mindset, or where were you mentally when um, Beats Headphones was acquired by Apple for $3 billion? Why would the most valuable company in the world buy into an emerging headphone brand? Any takers? Like, just from the top of your head, like, why do you think Apple would, like, buy into headphones? I think Apple saw that, you know what? Um, majority of, as they call it, the urban youth culture movement is going this way. So if we don't catch this train right now, it's going to be way too late in 10 years' time. You know, it's going to cost us $50 billion to buy. To me, it's also that looking at getting into the market was a nice entry point. The, the went in with the line of market, iTunes, music and all of that, but beats by Dre. It's a massive market that they knew was just booming and growing at such an exceptional pace. So, um, I think... We're all generally like on the right track. Um, Apple has got like advisors for years, so they'll never make an acquisition on anything. They wouldn't buy this bottle of water without sitting around a table and asking themselves why this water or this water bottle is so important to the bottom line of the business. And um, Apple knew that in order to have a strong presence and a market share into the digital streaming age, and tomorrow, because that's what Apple promises you, tomorrow, it promises you the future, that they needed to buy into culture. And you guys are right. They, they bought into culture. Because if they bought into a headphone brand with tradition, with quality, they would have gone to Techniques, they would have gone to Sony, they would have gone to Monster, that have gone to Pioneer because those are traditional brands in the headphone space. But they bought into culture because of the cultural, cultural collateral that um, Beats by Dre had. And what and who moves culture? Sports and entertainment. So there's a funny story about um, how some of these guys got these Beats by Dre headphones. So there's a guy called Jimmy Iovine. Um, if you, you guys have watched the Defiant ones, um, where they talk about like, their journey with Dr. Dre, and he's basically the brains behind um, who Dre is now and how he's positioned himself as a producer, a brand, and, and just a, 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 an ambassador in, in his community. Um, 
Eminem says that uh, you'd never walk into Jimmy's office without Jimmy giving you a pair of beats and taking a picture. That would be like a cardinal sin, like it was either you or the headphones. So, and it worked. I mean, um, it filtered into sports. Guys like Neymar wore the headphones without getting paid a cent. Lil Wayne, Serena, when she won a championship, I can't uh, put my finger on which one it was, but when they did that whole thing about the first woman in Compton to, to win a huge Grand Slam championship, um, LeBron, who was very close to Dr. Dre and, and the rest of the guys, and a couple of other influencers. And you're probably asking yourself, what does all this info got to do with you? And my answer is that, well, it's got everything to do with you and how you should establish, position, maintain your personal brand in the urban culture space, age, and generation. But the question is still why? How? How, Sway? <laughs> My first, my first piece of advice, based on what I know, is just forget. Forget what the textbooks say. Forget, forget what Silas is telling you about personal branding. Forget what the fundies with millions and millions and millions of masters are saying. Because most of them aren't in touch with culture. And you, as an individual sitting here, know what you're about, know how much of yourself you're willing to give to culture, and what your purpose is. And I think that is basically the core of personal branding. And then after forgetting about what Silas says, <laughs> throw away his rule book. <laughs> throw it away, forget about his rule book, because in this day of social media, there are no rules. There is no right and wrong way. You need to define what works for you. You need to see what speaks to your end goal. And you need to pinpoint that and start harnessing that. So these are the three easy steps that I could basically come up with and especially from where I come from and what I've done with my personal brand. The first one is stay true to your course, no matter what, and always tell your authentic story. I think this speaks to my kind of brand and most successful brands because that statement just embodies friendship. And nobody goes on social media and follows somebody that they don't feel connected to. Relatability. My second statement is keep honing your craft. I know there are people in engineering, in the financial sector, yeah, um, a couple of uh, occupational therapists. And I almost feel that when you buy into a brand, no matter how cool the brand is on social media and how relatable it is, that person still needs to do the business of the day, which is very important. But you also need to find a creative way to merge what you're doing with new technology. Because let's be honest, new technology moves the world, whether we like it or not. Whether I deactivate my Instagram account today, the world won't stop. If I hated Snapchat like I used to, the world won't stop. So almost try to find a creative way to merge what your key purpose is, which is your career, and your calling to what new media is doing and new technology. And the third one is find a place and a voice in the urban youth culture space. You need to speak youth. You need to relate to youth. You need to look youth. Because 
Those are the consumers. Um, I was watching something again on YouTube. <laughs> Don't worry, I've got a TV. <laughs> And um, I was watching Tyler, the creator, um, speaking to a guy called Zane Lowe from Apple Music. So they do these one hour long profile interviews. And um, Zane Lowe asked Tyler, the creator, what the best advice he's ever gotten was and who it was from. And he said it was from Pharrell Williams. So Pharrell Williams told Tyler, the creator, and you'd expect this from Pharrell, that do not grow old, grow wiser which is very, very profound. Because once you grow old, there are certain things that, whether they're moving or moving the world, you just don't want to adapt to because you feel like, ah, that's where the kids are. But if you're wiser, you're able to engage where the world is going with whatever experience or backhand experience that you've got. And you're able to make more sober-minded decisions in what you want to be in that space and how you want to play in that space. Oh, sorry. Too much of this, we talk about like, the authentic story, for example, and stay in tune with culture and things are going where, where then do you draw the line in terms of your true authentic story versus culture and, and so in terms of with regards to your brand. So let's say, let's say let's take it away from youth culture, let's say maybe corporate culture. For example. There's certain culture in corporate, and then you may have your own authentic brand. Sometimes it may not always be in line with that, and yet you still have to be deliberate in what you would like to portray on yourself. Um, so I, that was sort of the, 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 the debate. The debate. In terms of, at which point then does it, what was the word? Pretending. Yeah. Is it pretending? At which point is it deliberate? And how do you continue to, to, to maintain the same brand throughout within those different environments? Because when you mention Kanye West, for example, it's a thing. Yes, he's very authentic, and his authenticness has done all these things, but then that same authenticness... On, on, on those two points, let's start with the Kanye West one. Um, Kanye's never changed. Like, he's been crazy. He's been, he like, that's his USP. That's his unique selling point. He's been crazy. From, from his first album, when he recorded his first breakout single, Through the Wire, he had just gotten out of an accident, couldn't speak properly, but recorded an entire song that we consumed and we bought into. That's madness, bruh. Yeah. You wouldn't get into an accident today and then come to class. You know what I mean? And, and... Um, the fact that um, Kanye West um, went and sided with Donald Trump and he was black, he actually came out and said, um, if politics were, were, were about you choosing a political stance, why is it that I'm forced to side with everyone of my color because of my political beliefs? Because what you see in Trump is not what Kanye sees in Trump, and it's not what I see in Trump, you know? And that's, and that's the biggest thing he was fighting. Kanye West was essentially saying, out of everything that we were saying about Trump, was that um, I believe in the fact that you can be whatever you want to be if you've got the balls and if you put work into it. And that's what he said. He said, I love Trump because out of, against all odds, that idiot became the president of the biggest country and the most influential country in the world. And that's what he was saying. But we were too cooped up in our emotions and what Trump was saying from a policy perspective that we were misled, you know what I mean? And by what Kanye was attracted to. And talking about being fake and, 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 and almost um, not being authentic, I feel that um, when you're building a personal brand, you need to be as true to yourself as possible because when you're a personal brand, when you Kanye, people will constantly look at you when you're looking the other way. So the truer you are about your story, your cause, where you come from, 
who you speak to, what you speak to, and your background, you don't have to worry when you've turned your back on whoever you're trying to sell to. Because your silhouette will still sell who you are. Um, so the example that you made now of Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump is a brand that we're forced to consume, whether we like it or not. What then or how then do we use this in a context where people have options? Because this kind of feels very inward focused and I'm, I'm trying to find a, like how does the market then fit in? Like at what point do you start looking outside to see if there's an audience, to see if there are people that are willing to consume or buy? I'm talking personal branding now, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about like your, your core beliefs, you know? The reason why um, you're probably not as close to everyone in this room is because there are certain things that um, I might not like about you and I almost shy away from you, you know what I mean? Or maybe he might like about you, that's why you guys are close, you know? So the truer you are to who you are, I almost feel that um, will almost make things easier about the story that you're selling as yourself and to who you need to sell it to. We need to realize that we're not bred. We're not trying to be consumed by everybody. You're a niche, as you sit there, you're a niche brand, you're a niche individual. And embrace that, that certain people might like you, you might boggle other people's minds, but certain people won't like you, and that's okay. But it doesn't take away from the fact that you're being true to your values, morals, and who you want to be. And that's why there's a, there's, there's a clear distinction between a corporate, an institutional, or, or an organizational brand, and a personal brand, because this is you exuding who you are and what you want the world to know you as. Okay, so... Um, Let's look at two very influential individuals in the urban culture space that juggled these principles very well. Let's start with Lex Leo, Dr. Smile. So Lex Leo is a dentist by profession. Very good at what he does. Studied, got the belts, got the gowns, you know. I don't know what else he got. And, um, but through through him being like a, 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 a dentist, he tried dabbling into the celebrity space where he tried music, it didn't work out. He tried the whole fashion thing. He was acknowledged by GQ as one of the best dressed men, I think in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it also wasn't a, 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 a proper, tangible career to get into, coming from being a dentist that is really good at what he does. So the brightest thing that Lex Leo did to create the unorthodox rebranding and brand Dr. Smile was that he knew he had a footprint in the celebrity circles. So if you know Lex Leo, you know that like, he'll definitely go to an opening of any envelope, any cutting of ribbons, and is generally cool and friendly with most celebrities in our country. But what he did during his process was that he said, okay, I'm a good dentist and I need to acknowledge that I'm a really, really good dentist, but I've got the social capital that is my celebrity friends. Let me actually sell these guys to drive the kind of dentist that I am. So Lex Leo gets celebrities to do their teeth, <coughs> check their gums, to do whatever dentists do. And what he does, just before you leave, you guys take a picture. <laughs> and that is advertising. If AKA had to be approached by BMW today, BMW would pay an arm and a leg for AKA's face to be anywhere close to the brand. If Casper, who was approached by Samsung, they paid an arm and a leg for his face to be on their brand or next to their brand. But Lex Leo gets it for free. And he created 
the brand Dr. Smile, and which I think was probably one of the brightest moves in urban culture. Another guy, DJ Euphonic. <laughs> so Euphonic started off as a DJ, very good DJ, very good producer, had a couple of hits under his belt, had very um, uh, uh, successful compilations, and um, had a bit of money at his disposal when he was in his prime and wanted to invest because he realized that entertainment is a young man's sport, firstly, and that um, in one way or another, his fame is going to die out. And the constant advice he was getting is that invest into property, like most other entertainers. So Euphonic buys his first house, turns it into a commune, and he stays with students. <coughs> with all that money, he's able to purchase other properties. He's now a property mogul. But he's as good as the next guy in the industry with a nice portfolio of properties. How do I become like the stick out property guy? With the fame, with the social capital, and with the story to tell. Euphonic partners with Baldwin, which is one of the biggest um, de developing company, property developing company in, in the country, to become an ambassador to start property talks with Euphonic. So they go around the country, they give these talks, they teach us young people about how to buy your first house, what is a good buy, what's a bad buy, how do you get loans from the bank, um, where to buy, where not to buy, etc., etc., etc. And with that, with his process, ENCA picks up on this and they're like, there's a lot of social capital in that. Let's give this guy his own TV show on our platform, on arguably one of the biggest news platform in the country. Dr. Smile, like I'm trying to think what is his brand? Because when I, I follow him on Instagram and I see him as a celebrity dentist, not much different to other dentists, except that his target market is celebrities. And even if you try to book an appointment with, with him, you'll get one for next year. Yet you see celebrities always say, oh, chip a tooth, called Dr. Smile. He was able to fit me in in 10 minutes. So for me, He's not for like the people, or is that his brand? I want to be a celebrity. My, my, my thing is that he's, he's, he's been able to use celebrities and all of his celebrity capital to actually push his brand. And when you think dentist, when you think, let me book an appointment, Dr. Smile first and everyone else after. So m m my thing about how Dr. Smile positioned his practice or whatever, um, is that his niche, he's very glam, he's very famous, he's very, like, we could go to Randburg, we'll find a good dentist, you know? But it's not Dr. Smile. We can go to Randburg and want um, a bottle of Coke, you know what I mean? But if Coca-Cola is not there, then, then it's not the same, you know what I mean? And I feel that's how you create like a brand persona. The fact that um, if tomorrow there was a million dollar um, toothpaste brand that needed an authentic ambassador, you're probably the first guy to, to go to, to be on our TVs every single night during generations because he's built that social capital. So sometimes it's really not for me and you, but it's actually to create and build a bigger picture. So talking about Euphonic, Euphonic gets on um, ENCA and now Euphonic has got his own TV show. So what are your thoughts on, okay, Euphonic, then there's Temba. Because then it's a split brand, but it's one person. Like My idea of the band, uh, brand Euphonic is, is very local and South African entrenched, and the brand Temba speaks to him gigging overseas. And that's just the bottom line of, 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 of that, because sometimes changing perceptions of a local brand and what its core values were here 
uh, becomes more difficult than actually starting a new brand that is just focused to a different market. And a lot of people have done that. I mean, DJ Smoot did it with Mzegezeg, you know what I mean? Allegedly. Well, allegedly, <laughs> you know? But um, a lot of guys have been doing this, and, and, and it works. If, 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 if you're able to, to pinpoint whatever target market you speak to, and you know exactly how to reach the target market. Sometimes um, guys are, 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 are patient enough to take whatever brand that is entrenched in South Africa and move it overseas, and it works. But some guys believe that um, I need to build another brand that is going to just speak to a different market and that won't have the, um, the resemblance of, of whatever I've established in the country anymore. So just to wrap it up, always remember that in this age of urban and social culture consciousness, without social media, you're as good as mute. Everybody, I believe, has to have a presence on social media. And um, how your presence and your brand on social media is going to be is up to you. I can't speak on any body in this room. If, if you're in the financial sector and you want to start a social media account that is teaching people about money-saving tips, that's your voice on social media. It does not necessarily mean that you need to be trolling people or trending every day, but that's just how you want to position yourself. You've got a voice. Your voice is money. Your voice is money saving, you know? And that's what I believe. Keep in mind that if your engagement has no substance, direction, causes no reaction, you're as good as mute. So whatever you put out there needs to speak to the needs of what's going on around us. So if you are a therapist, for instance, um, there are a lot of people that um, go through living life um, on, 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 the basis of, or, or on the basis of what social media says, you know? And, and in South Africa, I haven't seen that a lot. I haven't seen therapists coming out and saying, hey man, I'm not gonna get into too much of your business, but um, this is one, two, three, about like how to be able to consume certain things on social media and how not to consume certain things on social media, because you're trained to do that as a, as a therapist. And you're not a fly-by-night brand, but you're literally just expanding on whatever brand that you've already built just by virtue of having that qualification and being able to speak that kind of language. And always be mindful that if your story is generic and has no emotional bait, you're as good as mute. People gravitate towards people that they can relate to. Relatability is a huge thing in real life and in social media. I think you've answered uh, a lot of my questions, particularly around the authentic story, because that's what I believe in. Yeah. And uh, I feel if you don't like my story, hey. So I, 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 I love those, that uh, triangle thing that you had, right? But uh, yeah, so my, my question then is also around, uh, so I partnered with YFM, I did a Dom and I'm a piano event at uh, the Sun Arena. Okay. Um, and um, um, I heard the first part of what you guys do, uh, what you, when you spoke about your brand and what people were talking about you, blah, 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 around the Amor Pianos. Um, I feel that uh, it's great you brought it on and, and all that kind of stuff, but I still also feel that the reason why I run it every year now is because it's just not out there still. Even though it's there, but there's just no one is really picking up these young boys. These guys produce a record five minutes in a little bedroom and it ends in that bedroom. Um, you know, if you're not with Maporis or Gabza, you know, and, and, and some of the people that are around. So my, my, my question, and maybe it's a challenge to you, maybe it's a bit of a selfish challenge, but, um, I, I, you know, we need to have a chat uh, with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, oh, sorry, I, I just, you know, while I'm at it. I'd rather have a, a chat around promoting it, because as much as you brought it on, you can't just bring it and leave it. Because at the moment, these kids are left, uh, you know, homeless, you know, and, and, I, and we are trying to bring them, that's why we've got this 
gong thing and I'm a piano all the time. Um, so year after year, you know, maybe I should just get you as an ambassador for it, buddy. <laughs> I am probably the only radio show in the country that will play a kid's mix from Brits. If you listen tonight on YFM, between 10 and 11, you'll know. On that Amapiano Piano Hour, literally no bodies, kids that are raping their hoods, and they just want a platform. And I've done that for the past six years. Wait, what time is the show? My show is from 10 till 2 in the morning. Every Saturday? Every Saturday, yeah. Any other questions? No question. Thank you, and let's keep in touch.